go, have gone, will go to love us, dear God. God, help for that just to sink into our hearts and our minds, our souls, dear God. And God, as we open up your words, and God, just understand that everything you've done since before the foundation of the world began, and God, all the way through to the end and the new heaven and new earth is all, all based on the fact that you love us. It's all for us. God, help us truly understand it. And God, let us love you. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. And you guys sound better every week. They sound better every week. Not that they ever didn't sound good, but there was a little glimpse of a moment there. I saw TJ, and he had those drumsticks, and he was just getting ready, and then he held up. And I'm just like, oh, we're just, we're just going to have to let him go one week, all right? We're just going to have to let him go. So, anyway. Set my people free. That's right. Set my people free. That's right. Well, listen, I know there's a lot going on this week. We've got people missing. There's the Walleye Festival. There's... Homecoming was last night in Hemlock in the area school prom homecoming prom sorry prom and uh, um, and then we've got some people out sick and so uh, uh, anyway I'm glad you're here and uh, I think I may have scared some people off because last week I I told you this week we're talking about prostitutes all right so that's what we're gonna do all right so here we go let's go. This isn't any pretty woman movie tale, all right? Uh, this is prophetic truth revealed to us to understand what's to come and therefore prepare us, again, to be ready for what's to come. Let me pull up an image here real quick. Uh, it's, again, you've seen this graphic before, but it's just to kind of lay out that we have the we have the seven seals. Remember that scroll with the seven seals? And, and there was no one worthy to open the scroll, and then... Um, the slain lamb stepped forward. Obviously, that's Christ, the only one worthy. And it began to unroll that scroll and break the seals. And those seals then released or um, basically judgment that comes from God in the seven trumpet judgments. And then when it gets to that seventh trumpet, when that sounded, then the seven bowl judgment, or some of you by whatever translation of scripture you use, and they say vile, but bowl judgments. And so there's those. We kind of walked through some of that stuff last week in Revelation chapter 16. And so here we are in Revelation chapter 17 today. And um, listen, there's a lot in this to unpack. We're going to go through a lot of verses um, fairly quickly, and we'll get to some life application. We'll, we'll park a little bit more, but uh, again, this is all uh, all good stuff. And so, it may seem like some of the topic is is sensitive, uh, but listen, it's God's word. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna preach God's word. All right, Revelation chapter seventeen, verse one and two, and then verse eighteen. That's how we're gonna kick off. It says, one of the seven angels who poured out the seven bowls came over and spoke to me. Come with me. Again, this is the angel talking to John. He said, and I will show you the judgment that's going to come on the great prostitute who rules over many waters. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her, and the people who belong to this world have been made drunk by the wine <clears throat> of her immorality. Verse 18, and this woman you saw in your vision represents the great city that rules over the kings of the world. Now, in those verses, we've got some words that we need to kind of define, and some of them may not need definition, but we're going to do it. So first, we're going to define what a prostitute is, all right? Some of your translation, it just says or, all right? Um, you can pretty much think of what it is, but I'll give it to you. If you go to the Greek, the actual word is Porne, P-O-R-N-A-Y, that's at least the phonetic pronunciation of it, porne. Um, obviously, as we go through these, you'll see that's where the terms porn, pornographic, all that comes from the root of that. But porne, it's a prostitute, a harlot, one who yields herself to defilement for the sake of gain. Any woman indulging in unlawful sexual intercourse, whether for gain or for lust. doesn't have to be woman, but 
That's how this definition was written, okay? So you understand what a prostitute is. Now we're going to talk about adultery. Or again, by translation, you might have fornication. By definition, or by the Greek word, that word is pornuo. Pornuo is how it's pronounced. And it's to commit sexual immorality. It's a metaphor to be given to idolatry, to worship idols, to permit oneself to be drawn away by another into idolatry. And then we have the word waters in there. And you don't even have to wonder what that means because in our chapter it actually defines what it means. It's figurative for uh, a nation or nations of people. So basically what you have in those verses we just read is you have nations of people being drawn away into spiritual idolatry by giving themselves to anyone, anything that isn't God. And um, in this case, it's giving themselves to this symbolic woman prostitute. Again, this is a what John see in this vision. It's, it's figurative. It's descriptive. I've told you all along in Revelation, we have things that are literal. We have things that are descriptive. All right. Uh, so again, this is a, a figurative descriptive thing. So the question becomes, again, he sees this prostitute, the great prostitute, you know, if that's a, a title to be proud of, but sitting on this scarlet beast. And so the question becomes, who's the woman? Who's the prostitute? Who's the harlot here? Who is John seeing in this vision? Well, again, verse 18, this woman you saw in your vision represents the great city that rules over the kings of the world. All right, so now we have a term of great city. I'm trying to give you some terms here that we'll get through and then we'll be able to start unpacking all this. What city would this be? What does that mean? How can you commit spiritual adultery with a city? All right? Now, this city, I'm just going to tell you, it's, it's complicated, okay? It doesn't mean it's not to be understood, but there is a lot here and more, more than we have the time, ability to get into here. But to it, get it into a nutshell, um, it's figuratively Babylon. Okay? Babylon was a literal place. Um, it was destroyed. God talks about the scripture never to be rebuilt again. God says don't rebuild it. That doesn't mean man hasn't attempted to. And it doesn't mean that man will not attempt to. But again, it's really kind of a figurative. So this could be literal, again, as well as figurative. But it's really more specifically a religious Babylon. Religious Babylon. Um, that doesn't mean godly. Okay? Uh, you hear me say it all the time. You can be religious and be religiously wrong. Right? I'll give you a great example just because it ties in. Last week I told you uh, over in Ukraine, Russia, uh, they work off of a different calendar in that part of the world, so they celebrated Easter. And so some of you, maybe if you caught the news, you saw uh, Putin at an Easter service holding the candle, making the sign of the cross, and worshiping God while he's committing all these evil atrocities. <clears throat> So religion means nothing, right? Relationship. Relationship is what counts. So Babylon, what was it? Old Testament, Genesis chapter 11. I'm going to read you some verses. I don't remember uh, if these verses are going to be up here. I don't remember if they made the cut or not. But I'm going to read them to you. But um, that's where there was one people, one language. They decided to build this tower, the Tower of Babel. Let me read you just the account here. It's Genesis 11, 4 through 9. The Bible says this, And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose tops is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So think about this. There was a group, again, early civilization here. The people were all together in one place, and they all spoke one language. All right? And again... In doing so, they decided, let's build this tower all the way to heaven. All right? Verse 5, But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower the people were building. 
Look, he said, the people are united. They all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. God was not trying to squash uh, uh, opportunity. He was trying to squash um, false worship. All right? Uh, come, uh, it's really interesting if you look in the verse, verse 7, it's come, let's go down. Let's, it's actually uh, the Trinity is literally what that's referencing. Let's go down and confuse the people with different languages, then they won't be able to understand each other. And that way the Lord scattered them all over the world and they stopped building the city. That is why the city was called Babel, because then you get Babylon, because that is where the Lord confused the people with different languages. In this way, he scattered them all over the world. So the whole tower building thing, because you might think, well, I don't understand what was up with that. You know, it's just like playing the game of Genia. It's just a big old tower. What could God have, be upset with? Well, again, they were trying to build it to heaven. There, it was basically had become was going to become something of false worship and idol worship. That's what it was. It was to elevate man into a spot to basically say, "I will build this all the way up to the sky. I'm God. I will be God." Obviously, you understand where their influence was coming from because that's obviously Satan and his pride fell because he believes, wants you to believe that he is God, right? So again, this Babylon, it's figurative, it's symbolic. Somebody wrote this, they said, every age has featured a Babylon, a political and economic system that has sought to control people's minds and destinies. So again, I'll, I'll just reference because it's an easy example. Um, Putin's got all of Russia believing his lie for why they're in this war, and then he's also got the religious sect saying, giving him their blessing, even though he's making them give him his blessing, all right? So that the people, well, the priest says this is right. Our government says this is right. It's all a lie, but everybody believes it. Right, because it's all controlled by evil. All right, so again, it's just an example. Revelation chapter 17, verse 3. So the angel took me in the spirit into the wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that had seven heads and ten horns, and blasphemies against God were written all over it. Now, the scarlet beast, it's been mentioned before in Scripture. We'll give you a couple of verses here. Revelation 12, 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and on his head seven diadems, or crowns, kingdoms. Revelation 13, 1. Then I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. It had seven heads, ten horns, ten crowns on its horns, and written on each head were names that blaspheme God. The beast is the Antichrist, and the prostitute, this religious, false religious Babylon, is riding the beast. And listen, what ends up happening with people is mankind doesn't always realize that they've tied themselves with the enemy. They've slept with the enemy until it's too late, and this leads to their destruction. Somebody, again, commentary here. She is symbolic, talking about the prostitute. She's symbolic of Babylon, which in turn is symbolic of human society organized independently of God. In different eras and cultures, Babylon shows itself in different ways. In John's day, it stood for Rome, but its fullest expression will be at the end of the age as it heads for inevitable judgment. The picture is of the human race's pursuit of prosperity and power through collective effort. Rulers make decisions based on self-interest and their people support them. Nations seek selfish gain through political and economic treaties but such unions are likened to sexual relations with a prostitute. They are unions of shame and dishonor, for they ignore God's standards and oppose his authority. All right, let's keep building here. Verse 4. The woman wore purple and scarlet clothing and beautiful jewelry made of gold and precious gems and pearls. In her hand she held a gold goblet full of obscenities and the impurities of her immorality. Again, just given the description, you know, there... 
Why is man drawn to a prostitute? It's that allure, it's that lust, right? Um, you and I know that our world, especially American society, is drawn by money, right? Money changes everything as far as if money's the goal, then whatever it is to get to that money must be okay, because that's just capitalism, right? Um, verse 5, a mysterious name was written on her forehead, Babylon the Great, mother of all prostitutes and obscenities in the world. I could see that she was drunk, drunk with the blood of God's holy people who were witnesses for Jesus. I stared at her in complete amazement. Why are you so amazed, the angel asked. I will tell you the mystery of this woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns on which she sits. John was amazed. You can imagine. He's seeing this vision. I mean, let's be honest. You've got this great prostitute sitting on this scarlet beast, these heads and all this stuff, and you'd probably be gazing too. But the angel kind of checks John here, and it's like, look, neither the beast nor the prostitute get glory. It's God who you need to be seeing here, John. Right? Verse 8. The beast you saw was once alive. Okay, this gets really interesting, all right? I'm going to give you a tidbit here in a second. Maybe something you guys have never heard before. But you'll think it's kind of cool. Give you something to think about. Listen real close to the first part of this verse. The beast you saw was once alive, but isn't now. And yet he will soon come up out of the bottomless pit and go to eternal destruction. And the people who belong to this world, whose names were not written in the book of life before the world was made, will be amazed at the reappearance of this beast who had died. There's an old commentator, his name's A.W. Pink, uh, from a long time ago. He's got some notes, uh, and um, there are other theologians that kind of think this. So what I'm about to tell you, I just want you to understand, this is theory. It could be true, may not be true. It doesn't matter, all right? One day we'll find out, but it's possible that there's an identity of the Antichrist here, and it's possible that the Antichrist could be Judas Iscariot. Now, hear me out on this, where this all goes. I'll give you some verses. And again, might be right, might be wrong. Okay? Ultimately, it's not an essential belief thing. It doesn't matter, because his identity will be revealed. Okay? Alright? John 17, 12. Let me read this verse to you. Again, I don't know that it's up here. If you want to make notes, make notes. John 17, 12. Jesus said this. Those whom you gave me, talking about the disciples, Jesus is talking to the Father. Those who you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition. It's talking about Judas. Judas was lost. He was never one of those. Jesus gives him the title, son of perdition. Again, that's John 17, 12. All right, let me build on that. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, the Bible tells us this. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling, the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or, is, or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Again, that's a reference to Antichrist. So we had Jesus with a reference of Judas. We've got this verse as a reference to the Antichrist, both using term son of perdition. And then in Luke 22, uh, verse 3 through 5, the Bible says this, Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. Now, the reason why that verse is important is because in all of Scripture, never is it ever said of a person that Satan entered them. That was right before the betray the betrayal. All right. And so then you have the beast you saw was once alive, but is it now? And soon yet he will come up out of the bottomless pit. So we talked about this before. There's a resurrection by Satan, right? Because he copies everything that God does. So I throw that out there to intrigue you, get you to study a little bit. Might be right, might not be right. Ultimately, does not matter. There is an Antichrist, and his identity will be revealed 
when it is time to be rebuilt. All right? So when, I'll give you that to, to stew on, go home, and research a little more. Revelation 17, 9. This calls for a mind with understanding. The seven heads of the beast represent the seven hills where the woman rules. They also represent seven kings. Now let me pull up a picture here. So Rome sits around seven hills. Now I'm not saying that this is Rome. Again, we already talked about kind of John in his day because again this is figurative description but well, I'll read you what somebody wrote here. They said the seven mountains probably symbolize the city of Rome built on seven hills. Certainly in John's day, the Roman Empire was living in luxury, spreading false religion, polluting the nations with its idolatry and sin, and persecuting the church. Some of you, if you've, you've had other Bible teachers, they've talked to you about this revived Roman Empire. That's where this is coming from, as it's laid out here, and then even in prophecy in Daniel. You're going to have basically a revived Roman Empire. doesn't mean it's Rome itself, but it's, it's the influence that they had on the world is what will be revived. Okay? Verse 10. Five kings have already fallen. The sixth now reigns. The seventh yet to come, but his reign will be brief. The scarlet beast that was, but is no longer, is the eighth king. He is like the other seven, and he too is headed for destruction. The ten horns of the beast are ten kings who have not yet risen to power. They will be appointed to their kingdoms for one brief moment to reign with the beast. They will all agree to give them their power and authority. Verse 14. Together they will go to war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will defeat them because he's Lord of all lords, King of all kings, and his called and chosen and faithful ones will be with them. Verse 15. Then the angel said to me, the waters where the prostitute is ruling represent masses of people of every nation and language. The scarlet beast and his ten horns, notice this, all hate the prostitute. Now hang on. I thought the prostitute was riding the beast. I thought they were working together. Listen, they are, but no different than man after he pays his transaction is done with the prostitute. Satan will be done with the prostitute. He's robed that false religion until no longer needs it because he sets himself up to be worshipped as God. Right? So I've got the whole world in all this false religion. Satan, to a degree, doesn't care who they worship. Not God. But you get them all confused and mixed up to worship everything until I come up and say, okay, now worship me. And I'm done with you false religion I am religion. All right? That's what Satan's going to do. Uh, somebody here said, ultimately the Antichrist will not tolerate any worship except of himself. The son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that's called God or that's worshipped so that he sets in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Verse 17. For God has put a plan into their minds, a plan that will carry out his purposes. They will agree to give their authority to the scarlet beast, and so the words of God will be fulfilled. And this woman you saw in your vision rep uh, represents the great city that rules over the kings of the world. All right. That's a whole lot. All right. Now let me give you some application. Again, how does that affect you and me? How does it change how you and I live, how we're supposed to live? Again, it's a complicated passage of Scripture. Again, John's seeing this vision and imagery to help us reveal or help show us what's to come as it was revealed to him. And again, he was amazed at first by the, the woman and the beast until the angel said, look, come see the judgment. So I use that to tell you, listen, don't be amazed with anything that Satan or the world does and don't miss the message. Right? It's God. It's God. There's three things very quickly in this that we're told God is going to send judgment. There's no stopping that. There's no thwarting it. It is going to happen. Anyone can deny it. It doesn't matter. It's coming. It says the Lamb will defeat them because He's Lord of all. 
It also says God has put a plan into their minds, a plan that will carry out his purposes. Listen, God never put the plan into their minds to worship false religion or Satan. He gave man the freedom to choose whom to worship because he loves us so much, he wants us to choose to worship him, but he will never pull the strings on you as a puppet. It's free will. And it's basically, you know, you old saying where you say, you know, give someone enough rope, right? That's what he's doing. He's letting them make their own decisions. But he has full knowledge of their decisions knowing what anybody and everyone will do so everything is always ultimately by his control because he knows how it all ends and how it all goes the bible says proverbs chapter 21 verse 2 he who commits adultery lacks sense he who does it destroys himself and then proverbs chapter 23 verse 26 oh my son give me your heart may your eyes Take delight in following my ways. A prostitute's a dangerous trap. A promiscuous woman is as dangerous as falling into a narrow well. She hides and waits like a robber, eager to make more men unfaithful. Listen, how do you keep yourself from committing spiritual adultery? How do you keep yourself from committing spiritual adultery? It's in those verses, the very first thing, verse 26. Look at that again. May your eyes take delight in following my ways. Listen, may your eyes take delight in following God's ways. The only satisfaction, whatever it is you need, comes in him and his ways. And if you will stay faithful and loyal to him, I promise you, you will not lack one thing and will have everything you need emotionally, physically, mentally, financially, whatever it is. Now, I'm not talking about prosperity. I'm not saying it will be easy, but I'm telling you, you will have a peace that passes all understanding because you have been faithful to him. And he loves you. And he is a faithful God, even when his people are not. Right? Jeremiah 7, 23 says, Obey my voice, I'll be your God, you shall be my people. Walk in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. Listen, no one goes to the red light district to a prostitute, pays the prostitute, or lays with the prostitute if they didn't choose to be there. Listen, you make the choices that put you where you are. Right? Psalms 119, 37 Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. When you guys get off track, you took yourself there. You set your eyes on something that was worthless and decided, I believe it's worth it all. And it's not. <laughs> right? You're sleeping with the enemy and you don't even know it. Colossians 3, 5, so put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Keep your eyes on God, the things of God. Don't let your eyes fix or gaze on things of the world. The Bible says your words a lamp to my feet, a light unto my path. If you're off the path, then you get back to the path by getting your eyes back on his work. Because that's the path and that's the light. <laughs> One more point here and we're going to be done. Give God your heart. Again, back in our verses. Give God your heart. None of you want to be in a relationship where you're cheated on. Neither does God. Right? If you've been cheated on or you're the one maybe that was a cheater, listen. There's hope because of God's grace and mercy. And that's a whole other message for a whole other day. That God loves the cheated and the cheater. All right? And his grace can restore anyone and any relationship for that matter. But God doesn't want you sleeping with Satan, nor anyone Satan uses to thwart your relationship and fellowship with him in. God wants your devotion and heart. He demands it. And you should want him to have it because... It's to your benefit, your reward, to your life, everlasting. Matthew 22, 37, Jesus said, You must love the Lord your God, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. 1 Timothy 1, 5, 
All believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and genuine faith. How do you give God your heart? You probably, if you've been in church any time, it's you, so many messages are like, give God your heart. Give God your heart. Well, how do I give God my heart? What does that mean? What if I told you that Scripture actually tells you how to give God your heart? I mean, it spells it out. You don't have to even wonder. I'm going to give it to you. Jeremiah 29, 13. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I know you're thinking, ah, that doesn't get it to me. I get it, but that's still give me your heart and you'll have me. How do I give him my heart? Proverbs 21, 2. People may be right in their own eyes, but the Lord examines their hearts. Okay, we're starting to get close here. Then. Listen, your way will never be right if it's not God's way. You understand that? People may be right in their own eyes, but the Lord examines their heart. You, you want to know if you're right or not? Check it. God, I am choosing to do this. I think I should do this. Whatever it is. Is that right? Is that right? A lot of people, you know what you, you do? You make decisions and you never once go to God for it. You just do your thing. And you think, well, because I'm a believer, God gives me freedom and liberty, so therefore, whatever I do is right. That, come on, there's many that preach that. I'm all about liberty, but listen, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. Listen, where do you get your strength? You get from Christ. It has to be Christ. You have to be Christ-centered. You have to come to Him, right? His Word and Him. Psalms 51.10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. How about this one? I said, how do you give God your heart? You can't. How about that? Not the answer you wanted, was it? What did David write? Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Guess how you give your heart to God? You go to him and say, God. I want to give you my heart. I don't know how that works. But I'm, I'm surrendering to you. And guess what? God then does the work. Because it's always God that does the work. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. That's how you give God your heart. I'm going to ask you about your hands. Listen, let's just take a moment. Let's just be real blunt, right? You may think, you know what? I would never, ever sleep with a prostitute. Maybe somebody in here has. I'm not here to judge that. Listen, I'm here to tell you if that's your case and maybe have guilt or whatever about it, God can forgive you, wants to forgive you. There is no sin that can be committed by man that God will not forgive. The Bible says there's actually only one, and that's rejection of the Holy Spirit. It's a rejection of Christ. But listen, maybe you're here and you think, I'd never do that, but yet you are doing it. You've let the world... You've let the world in, and you're sleeping with the enemy, and you don't even realize it. Ask God to just speak to your heart and say, God, I, I don't know where it is, but God, if, if there's a place in me, my heart, that's that's unclean before you, or I've let the world influence me or come in, God, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. God, let me fix my eyes on you and not be distracted by anything else. I just want to see you, Lord. Guide me and direct me, and I will be obedient to follow. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before you, God, I pray, I ask that the people here in this place, online, wherever they're at, dear God, God, as they hear your word, that God would just commit to you. God, there's no one here, dear God, that would want to sleep with Satan. But God, because we're human and sinners, we have let him get a foothold. 
we've let him have opportunity and place. And God, we're asking that you would point that out to us, that we'd seek your forgiveness for it, and that God would just be all about you, that you'd have our heart. You'd forgive us, you'd clean our heart, you would renew us with the right spirit that we're supposed to have. We can't even have that right spirit in and of ourselves, but God, you can give it to us. All you ask is that we come to you. I pray for these people here, dear God, in this place. And I pray your message would continue to resonate and not leave with them just as they walk out the door, but God, just continue to speak. And if whatever it is that we need to do, however it is we need to be obedient, that God, we'd be obedient to you. Thank you for your goodness. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Hey, real quick again, don't forget. Uh,